I love Sakina, as though she were my own. But we have a town we have to worry about here, boys. And if you try to hide this and people find out, They will understand, just like they did with Sarah. So you think? You think they understood about Sarah? Yes. No, 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 they didn't understand. They accepted it. People swallowed it, but they certainly did not understand it. They let it go because you told them they had Great, then I will tell them again. It's not going to work this time. Why not? Because they don't believe in you anymore. Not like they did. Welcome, Friendly Faithful. I am back to cover the newest episode, episode eight of season three, entitled Thresholds. Before I begin, if you're new here, just to let you know, I've been covering every single episode this season. I have a bunch of reviews you can look at in the description of some of the actors from the show. And this week, I have two interviews to share, one with Elizabeth Saunders, who plays Donna, and the second interview is with Hannah Sheremy, who plays Julie. Uh, also, just to let you know, if you like the content, please share and subscribe. I'm trying to get to 10,000 followers before the year is out. We're at about 1,500 now, so very close. So please make sure you support if you like this content. Without further ado, further ado let's start off with the first interview from Elizabeth Saunders, a.k.a. Donna. Hello. Good to see you again. I think I, we haven't spoken since season two, so obviously a lot yeah. has happened <laughs> since then. Let's start with covering episode 308. That's going to be coming this weekend. You know, Donna, I feel, has finally put her foot down about what she's willing to tolerate and what she's not willing to tolerate. Yeah. But throughout this entire season, it almost seems like she's getting close to the breaking point. This is the first time we've seen her break down, you know, during the season. Yeah. What do you think is keeping her together and how close do you think she is to that breaking point? I think th there's a really strong sense of survival need to survive in Donna and not just a need to survive for herself, but that she... I think at her core, she takes it very seriously that society succeeds, that society survives, uh, that individuals and that the group survive. Got it, got it. Yeah. Now, as far as mistakes go, I looked at how Boyd's been interacting with Acosta. I think compromising with the whole gun, giving her the gun back, even without the guns, is kind of a mistake. It's going to embolden her a little bit. But on Donna's end, do you think it's a mistake to have someone like that in Colony House? Because she seems ready to stir up a lot, you know, with her situation. I don't know if it's a mistake. Because I think, you know, if someone is in the house, they're in the house. Like, you can't go, no. Um, but she's the, of the people we have there in Colony House right now, she's the person most likely to cause an issue, for sure. Because Randall's not here. <laughs> so. Right. I was centering on Randall before, but I think Acosta is even more, because I guess Randall's a little bit out of his mind right now. I think Acosta Yeah. No, more. I'm actually feeling sorry for Randall right now. <laughs> right. For the first time ever. Yeah, yeah. You made also, or your character made a good point about to Boyd with everything that's been going on, the town doesn't trust you like they used to. You know, we've seen all these deaths. It seems like you're faltering in your decision making a little bit. How does Donna feel about that? Is her trust in Boyd a little bit shaken based on what's been going on in season three? I think her trust is is wavering, not in terms of her trusting him as a person, but I think she is starting to have misgivings about uh, how in control he is. Mm -hmm. And that his decision-making process is not safe. I thought it was very interesting in this episode where you clearly stated that if you don't tell the town or tell Colony House what happened to Tilly, I will. In her thinking, what do you, what do you think the result she wants? Because in my mind, I'm thinking they're going to want to get rid of Fatima, if that comes out, what does she think the end result is going to be by, you know, having that type of stance? By by get having him to forcing him to tell what's happened. Right. Yeah. Um. I need to just think on this because I got to go back Ooh. a little bit in my head on this. Okay. Um. That. Like I think it falls in line with Donna's 
Although she, you know, I was just going to say with her that she feels things need to be up front, but she has played it like she has played it with the, the food. She tried to hide people, hide it from people that That's we were true. losing food. Um, so I can't, you know what? I don't, I have this occasionally with Donna or that I don't probably like I have it with me. I don't mm-hmm. always know the reasoning. Right. And Maybe she that. hasn't thought it all the way through because I'm like, I know she doesn't want Fatima to die, but that's a potential possibility if people flip oh, out. Oh, no, she doesn't want Fatima to die. I think sometimes, too, is that, like, I don't know what where it's come from in terms of John writing it, but that we do make those kind of ultimatums with people when we've hit the end of the rope with them. You know? It's like, you have to deal with it. Very true. It's a little bit like husband-child sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Speaking of the husbands, they've been kind of struggling this entire episode. I was looking at Ellis and also Jim. They just don't know what to think. <laughs> the yeah. No, I know. Yeah. They're 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 being challenged for sure. Absolutely. Well, Liz, I'm actually happy you made it to this point. So at least you can be around to <laughs> see what happens in season four. But I appreciate you and looking forward to seeing where Donna goes next season. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we get to. I love doing it. Very helpful. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Big thank you to Elizabeth Saunders for this wonderful interview. So without further ado, let's get right into the second part of the interviews I had this week with Hannah Sheremy, who plays Julie. A lot went down with Julie with the whole time travel thing. And we also want to get some information on what's going on with her and Randall. So here's Hannah to discuss what Julie has going on in episode eight and possibly what's going to be happening with her in the finale. Hey, Hannah, good to finally meet you. I've been covering From for a couple of seasons now. This is the first time we're actually talking, so I'm really appreciative to get that opportunity. Um, let's focus on episode eight, because that's the one that's going to be coming up this weekend. You know, Ethan had a really interesting line when you went into the ruins about the hero has to be brave, and I think it kind of ties in. You're the first character that potentially has a superhero power now that can go through time. What do you feel about that? And do you think now Julie has the potential to be possibly the strongest character on the show? Oh, I don't know about strongest. I mean, <laughs> I think that this is a really, really cool storyline for Julie. And I'm so happy that I get to play this new part to her. But I think that, you know, strength can be determined in many different ways. I think that Boyd is probably stronger, maybe mentally and and has the capabilities to lead more than Julie. But I don't know, maybe this this superpower, as you call it, will will do some cool things for her. Absolutely. So just staying on that a little bit, let's say you do have the full-fledged power to change things when you go through time and all that. Aside from just not encountering the tree, what would you go back over the last two seasons and change if you had the ability to do so? Well, three seasons now. I think if you can change things, because as we know, sometimes time travel, if that's what this is. I still don't even know what it is. Mm-hmm. Time travel can have can get messy. So I feel like, but if that didn't have an impact, maybe just saving some people, just saving some lives. There were so many characters. I still miss Trudy from season one. She didn't have to go. Oh, right. So here's another interesting thing. After the last episode, episode seven, when I was talking on Twitter, there was a little bit of debate about where your relationship is now with Randall. I thought it was more like a teenage crush type of thing. Other people thought it was more just brotherly. And some other people thought it was maybe just him kind of taking Jim's place and doing fatherly duties, teaching you how to drive and things like that. Where do you see Julie's relationship with Randall after reading it? You know, I... I played it in kind of both ways. I played it in big brother, little sister way. But at the same time, I also did acknowledge like, you know, she's a teenage girl. He's kind of like the bad boy. She's been through a lot. And that seems to be like a very typical teenage girl thing to sort of then when you're neglected by your parents to run off, run away with an older guy. So I did acknowledge that a little bit that it was like, there could be like a little crush there. But I think that the big brother, little sister dynamic is more legal. And, and so I'd prefer it to be that. <laughs> very true. Very true. Now, when I was reading or watching the episodes, I'm always looking for signs of foreboding or what's about to happen, because there's always something bad that happens every couple episodes. I noticed Ethan a few episodes ago talked about how things could be if, you know, if your parents are no longer here, it's just going to be me and you. 
do you get the sense that something like that is potentially coming or do you think I'm reading a little too far into it? I don't know because Ethan has been so dark this season talking all the time about, well, what, what do we do when they find mom's bones? Like Victor thinks I'm going to die and mom and dad are going to die. It's just going to be us. I'm like, oh my God, chill. Like you're freaking me out, Ethan. So I don't know. He, he could be having some little premonitions. Who knows? He's just, he's been creepy this season. Very true. Now I want to mention Victor's character. We see kind of the results of what happens when your growth is stunted, when you end up in the town at a very young age, but he was really young. In your case, you're a teenager and we haven't really analyzed that yet. What ways do you think the town has potentially stunted Julie's growth, even though she's a little bit older, having to go through her teenage years in this type of scenario? I mean, it's obviously stunted her in the ways of like, you know, when you're, when you're 16, it's connection is everything and your friends are everything and school and drama and boys and all that sort of stuff. But I think that it's actually maybe helped Julie grow more than stunted her in that in other ways. So I think it's really helped her grow emotionally and maturity wise. So I would say it actually did kind of the opposite. Uh, Hannah, I appreciate your time. It's great to finally talk with you and can't wait to see where Julie goes in season four. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, big thank you to Elizabeth Saunders and Hannah Sheremy for the wonderful interviews they gave me this week. So now I'm going to get into my review uh, because we got so much content from Elizabeth and Hannah. This won't be as long as my other reviews, but there is a lot to go over. Let's start up with this whole situation with Tabitha and Victor and Sarah. It was very interesting. I feel like we learned a lot this episode about what's going on, but I also got a big disappointment, probably one of my biggest disappointments so far this season. So I want to touch on that before we go into the big thing with Fatima and Elgin and everything going down there. So the big thing with Victor is he's been trying to remember, right? We've been trying to find out when we're going to get this big scene of Jasper talking, revealing the secrets, but it turns out it wasn't Jasper. When Victor finally remembers what went down with uh, the conversation with Christopher. It was really the boy in white that was explaining everything to Christopher. And we found out that the children were murdered or sacrificed some type of way. These zombie kids that Tabitha is seeing, they were essentially betrayed either by the townspeople of their time, possibly their direct parents. And because of that, once they became spirits, their way to I don't want to say revenge, but to try and liberate their souls, not just liberate the people remaining in the town. They laid on the stones, as it was told to Victor by the boy in white, and they put all their wishes and hopes into the roots of the trees. And that created the faraway tree, which gives people, I'm assuming, an out back to the real world if they're able to channel it directly. So that's very interesting to know. And to find out that these children are being sacrificed, that kind of leads back to what I was saying potentially happened with Tabitha when she was a child. Because remember, she said something beyond the rock made her scream. Maybe she was one of the sacrifices that got away. That was one of the things that I was speaking about before. So it seems like that's correct. And maybe that's the reason why after all this time, she's being pulled back because the forces that want those sacrifices don't let anyone get away, at least not for too long. So that might be the reason why Tabitha is back here and her family may turn out to just be collateral damage. So that was very interesting. Another piece in the puzzle revealed. The disappointment I had is that, you know, we are watching a sci-fi horror show, right? So nothing would be more creepy than a talking uh, dummy. And that's where I thought we were going to be going, especially a demonic dummy. So to have that potentially on the table and to kind of get after, you know, multiple episodes of us waiting for this. If you look at some of my other reviews, I have, you know, Jasper up there in the thumbnails. And then all of a sudden later is no, it's not Jasper. Jasper never really talked at all. It was really a mistake uh, in Victor's memory. So that was a big letdown, you know, and that kind of worries me a little bit as far as how the finale might be, because we know with shows like this, there's always going to be a lot of theories, right? And there's only going to be one solution. And it's probably a solution that's staring us right in the face. But the issue you run in is that the theories can't be better than the actual solution and that's when you have the fan disappointment we saw that happen with game of thrones so here i'm like all right the solution with the boy in white cool not as horrible as 
you know, I thought it might be, but it's still not better than the whole talking demonic puppet, which we thought we were getting with Jasper. So that was a bit of a letdown for me. You can let me know if I'm kind of um going overboard with it, but I thought that was a missed opportunity with the show to have that type of dynamic and another possible entity in the realm like that represented by the uh dummy. So it looks like that's totally out of the picture now, but it gives us more insight about where these children are coming from and what is possibly the life force of the from universe. And it seems like the children are actively trying to combat that. We still don't know what role the boy in white plays in all of that. Is he one of the sacrifices that got away? Um, where does his power derive from? Is he the leader of the children? You know, are the two zombie children that Tabitha is seeing, are they working on the boy in white's behalf? So we still have a lot of questions there, but as Ricky E, who plays uh, Kenny, told me earlier in the season, he did promise in the later episodes kind of the fog about what's going on will be uh, revealed. So it seems like we're getting pieces of the puzzle as we head to the finale. So I do think that's a good sign that we're going to get some serious answers before season three is out. Um, I guess from there, the other big thing to go to would be obviously this whole thing with Elgin and Fatima. You know, I've been on the train for a while saying Elgin was going to do something to Fatima. I thought maybe he would try and kill her in her bed uh, or possibly kidnap her when we found the cellar in place. So that did happen. You know, all the clues were there, particularly in this episode when Fatima finally sees the uh, kimono woman. The very next scene we see is Elgin, and then he ends up going to Chrissy's place, sneaking in there and withdrawing his own blood, which I'm assuming is going to be for Fatima, because he said at the end of the episode after he kidnapped her that, you know, you're not feeding the baby. This is the reason why you're having all of these complications. So he is confirming via the kimono woman, that there is something growing in her that needs sustenance to survive and to grow, which is literally blood. So one thing I haven't thought about, and this dawned on me, uh, because I also like, I'm a big fan of Aliens, that whole franchise. I've always been assuming that if there was a night creature baby growing in her, that is going to be born the same way a human baby is born. It's going to be like a miniature night creature, but obviously different from regular human beings. But I think I'm making a misstep because I'm assuming that it's going to grow like a regular baby would grow. I mentioned aliens earlier. We know when the aliens are born, when they burst out of someone's chest, they're literally full grown in what, about an hour? And in movie time, even shorter, about 10 minutes, they're full grown. So maybe when this night creature baby comes out, there is not going to be a long uh, gestation period or a long growth period where it ends up before the end of the episode, we have another full grown night creature. And instead of me, my previous theory, thinking that Fatima was going to be the one that's going to turn and kill everybody possibly in Colony House or whoever's in the vicinity, maybe once the night creature baby is born, maybe it becomes full grown in a matter of a couple minutes. And that is the creature that ends up killing either Elgin, Fatima, possibly Ellis, anyone else that's around in the uh, vicinity of the birth. So that is something to keep in mind. I just thought about that before I did this uh, video about how everything is going to fall apart in this ending episode So, or in, in the finale. So I want you guys to keep an eye on that because I'm not really certain that it's going to be a long period of growth once this creature, whatever Fatima is carrying, is born. And also you have to keep in mind, I mentioned with the aliens, when they burst out of somebody's chest, uh, chest, they're killing the host when they're born. So obviously, I don't think we're going to have something like that where the baby's bursting out of Fatima's chest. But the the strain of the childbirth, you know, I'm assuming it's not going to come out like a regular baby. That could be what kills Fatima as well. So she might not even be in the picture once the night creature baby is born. So something to keep an eye on for episode nine and also the finale in two weeks. As far as um, the whole fallout from Tilly, I really think this whole situation is the beginning of the end, not only just for Boyd's leadership, but also the end of Colony House as we know it, because they're going down a point of no return. Donna mentioned very clearly, and I'm glad that she did, that the people have lost faith in Boyd. They don't believe in him the way that they did before. And the simple reason for that is because 
his whole claim to fame and the reason that people trusted him for so long is that he kept everybody safe. And then remember back in season one, they had the, the chalkboard. I think it was over a hundred days or even longer that nobody had been killed. Uh, and all that's out the window now. You know, that board is not even there anymore. Uh, and people are dying constantly. And it's one thing to worry about the night creatures. It's another thing to have an actual human killer in your midst. And that's even scarier because that's not something that you can be protected from in the daytime. If somebody is out of their mind and crazy, uh, they can get you at any given point. And once they find out that Fatima is behind this, here it is again, someone from Boyd's immediate family terrorizing people in town. We've had Boyd's wife going to killing spree. Now Fatima is going on a potential killing spree. And let's not forget Sarah, even though she's not immediate family to Boyd, Boyd is the one that protected her. So at some point, the finger pointing is going to go to Boyd and the people are going to mutiny. And on top of that, as we know, Acosta is around questioning Boyd's leadership at any given, you know, every moment, even to Kenny. And here she is a cop, a person that we associate with um, leadership, you know, so people are subconsciously, I think, going to be drawn to her. She's new there. She has new ideas. She's very um, forceful in her approach. So I think she's going to be the one to discover that this was a cover up because she's already asking all of the important questions. She's grilling Kenny about, well, why don't we have Sarah apprehended already? The people in Colony House are already ready to march on Sarah and basically lynch her is how Donna almost put it. Like they're ready to go to her home and put it to the torch. So already these people are on edge, ready to get revenge for Tilly. And if they find out that Boyd is covering this up, then that's going to be a complete breakdown at that point, because then Boyd is going to have to make a decision on how far is he going to go to protect Fatima when she's clearly in the wrong, killing an innocent woman like um, Tilly. And that's also a decision that Ellis is going to have to make. I mentioned before, I do think it's a possibility that if she does turn into a night creature, that Ellis is going to be the one that has to put her down, mirroring what his father had to do with his uh, with uh, his wife having to stop her from going on the killing spree. So a lot of moving parts there. And also with Donna, remember that she mentioned that if you don't tell the Colony House people what really went down, I will tell them. And I asked, you know, Elizabeth Saunders about this. She didn't really give a clear answer. But when I'm looking at it, Donna knows what that means if she tells the Colony House people that Fatima is the one that did this. They will not spare her. You know, they are angry, they are afraid, and they don't want any killers in their midst. It's one thing to have to worry about the night creatures. It's another thing to have to worry about people under your own roof. So I think that they would, I don't know if the box still exists anymore, but I do believe they will kill Fatima if they find out she, that she's behind this. And I do believe that Donna knows that deep down, which is why she tells Boyd, don't make me have to you know, make this type of decision and carry this type of weight because I shouldn't be the one to carry this. You should be the one that comes clean if you're calling yourself the leader of this town and not make this a cover up. So we have a lot of distrust brewing and I never thought about this, but maybe Donna ends up going with Acosta or maybe Acosta goes under Donna if, you know, Boyd continues to not want to tell people what really happened, and if Donna has to make that move, I do believe that Acosta will put her support behind her. So something else to keep in mind. So when I say the end of Colony House, I think it's going to be just an all-out mutiny, um, an all-out, you know, warfare, you know, between the factions at this point, because Boyd is clearly going to support his family. You know, when it comes down to situation like this, situations like this, people get very tribal. And I think that no matter what, Boyd is not going to cross his family and Fatima is his family now, despite what she's done. So I think that's the route that he's going to be going down. But even with all that said, there is a potential out to all of this. And the out to all of this is really Elgin. Because I mentioned before a possibility that if he tried to kill Fatima within Colony House and he was killed before then, uh, the blame could be placed on you know, Elgin being crazy. He lost his mind. We had to kill him to stop um, you know, him from murdering Fatima. And the people would buy it at that point because they've seen people lose their minds before, particularly with Sarah. But with this whole situation with the kidnapping and all that, if he ends up getting killed by either Fatima Ellis or Boyd, in terms of this cover-up, 
they can easily put the cover up of killing Tilly onto Elgin because everybody would buy it. He kidnapped uh, Fatima, a pregnant woman, kept her against her will, uh, and we were forced to put him down because he had this crazy story about this kimono woman. He's the perfect fall guy because no one else has seen, you know, this uh, decayed woman that's spiraling around besides Fatima. And, you know, Fatima, I can not be, it wouldn't surprise me if she didn't want to tell anybody about that. So that can be a way that all this gets kept a secret once they're able to rescue her until the night creature uh, baby is born. And then that's when all hell will break loose within Colony House and lead to another massacre. So I didn't think about this before, but Elgin is actually the perfect fall guy. And that can be a way that um, they can keep the secret uh, going into season four of Fatima uh, killing Tilly. I did not think about that before, but That's a strong possibility, very strong possibility. We do know eventually the truth will come out, but if they want to extend that into season four, I think this is the easiest way to do it. So something to keep an eye on. I think the whole next episode will be uh, more background into the kimono woman. Maybe she talks to Elgin and Fatima at the same time. I think we're going to get a lot of exposition there. And then the final episode will be the night creature birth or... Elgin being killed by either Ellis Boyd, if, you know, once they find out where Fatima is. I think all that unravels in the finale. And I think the next episode will be a lot more focused on what the Kimono woman really wants. You know, whose side is she on? What are her motivations? I think we get all that the next episode. Going on from there, I think the big thing we'll touch on now will be our first superhero in from universe, like I told uh, Hannah Sheremy, who plays Julie. Julie has a very strong power now. Before we were thinking Tabitha was the one that was chosen. Maybe it's really Julie because if she can go through time by going through, you know, the old ruins, what stronger power could you ask for? She can learn the entire purpose of the town, all the mistakes that they made previously, all the old conversations. And as um, Hannah mentioned, one thing that she would want to try and do is go back and save the people that we lost. So that is also a way that we can get some cameos from cast members who have passed on. You know, T and Chen might be able to come back. Uh, Hannah also mentioned uh, Trudy from season one. Remember the free spirit young lady that was in Colony House? We were all sad when she got killed in the first Colony House massacre. So it would be cool to maybe see her again. Um, remember that Jade is having the Civil War visions before in the old settlement. Uh, visions when he went out there. Maybe Julie can go that far back and find out, you know, what was happening then. I think what uh, the From franchise needs, which it hasn't had yet, is like a full flashback episode from a particular period, just to get more insight to what people were going through before the current cast was there. So I wouldn't mind a flashback episode back to the Civil War era. Uh, even back to this whole Jasper era where um, Christopher was there. So that would be kind of Victor's era. I wouldn't mind a flashback then uh, and seeing through Victor's eyes. You know, we've gotten bits and pieces of it, but a full flashback episode I think would be cool. And this would be a perfect way to do it because you would be seeing it through Julie's eyes. Game of Thrones has done that before um, with uh, some of their characters being able to go through time like that. And I'm thinking that Julie wouldn't be able to actually act on anything or change anything. I think she would only be able to uh, observe what's going on. So that would make it even more immersive if she can see what was happening or maybe even see alternate realities in the future. There's a lot of possibilities that they can do there uh, with her as long as she can harness that power, which I think she's going to be eventually able to do because why else would they even go down this path if it didn't lead to... Uh, learning more about the town and giving Julie uh, the ability to harness the truth of how they can get out of there. Also, one of the things that she can do is hopefully have another conversation with the old man that was in prison uh, and told her that she needed to get out of here because it wasn't safe. So I'm assuming that person is maybe the one benevolent entity in this entire um, from community as far as the supernatural beings, because why else would they have him in prison if for no other reason than the fact that he can possibly help the townspeople? So I want her to talk to him more and find out what's going on, because obviously he also wanted to help Boyd because it's flashed back to season uh, was it the end of season one or season beginning of season two when the rope was thrown down. 
Now we're finding out that Julie was the one that was able to do that. So now we're dealing with the whole time as a flat circle thing for everyone that may have watched True Detective, that the past, uh, the future, and the present, they're all occurring at the same time. So if Julie can harness all of that, she can possibly get everybody out of there with almost no time having been passed as far as their disappearance from the real world. So Julie, uh, like I said, I think this is our like our first full-fledged potential superhero if she can get this power together and harness correctly. And I think the old man that was in prison, he will be the key to doing that. Uh, final thoughts this episode, I'd say that I'm glad Jim got another talking to. He's been kind of out of control with being controlling with Tabitha you know, feeling that he knows best for everyone. And the funny thing is, everybody was full on supporting him when he wanted to do the whole tower project. But now that everyone's trying to do their own discoveries, he doesn't want that going down. He's trying to chew out Jade, telling Tabitha you can't go off anywhere. And I think that he really needed to hear that from Henry and Jade about himself because he's doing it mostly out of fear, which is understandable, but he's pushing his family away. So I think he got the reality check that he needed to get so hopefully he's going to be um, an asset to everyone for the final two episodes of this season instead of a detriment you know i think he needed he heard exactly what he needed to hear and hopefully he'll get his mind together as we head to episode nine next week and the finale in two weeks but i will wrap it up there so once again big thank you to elizabeth saunders and hannah sheremy for these wonderful interviews that they did for this week covering episode eight. Now for next week, I also have hopefully an interview coming with Cortian Moore, who plays Ellis, and we'll be talking about episode nine. So keep your fingers crossed that we can get that. And the big one that I'm hoping to get for the actual finale, I'm hoping to speak with none other than Harold Perrineau to talk about the finale, his initial thoughts, my initial thoughts, and where we're going to go with season four. So I have a bunch of things on deck. Let's just keep our fingers crossed that everything works out because obviously everybody's busy and has their own conflicting schedules. So I'm going to do my best to get those two interviews for you for episode nine and, the, and for the uh, finale. So thank you as always for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe and turn on your notifications. And we'll be back next week to cover episode nine of season three. Thanks again. Take care and enjoy your weekend.